everyone and also like to welcome to this online sessions. My name is Kittisak Pratanakajangsi. I am the current chairperson of uh, EIPP and also the moderator of these sessions. The topic we are discussing today is on weaving knowledge, culture, and customary land rights with indigenous people food system. As we all know that indigenous people's knowledge, identity, well-being are closely linked with their land, territories, and resources. They are integral and part of indigenous people's life. Indigenous peoples have practiced sustainably managed and passed down from the uh, passed down from generation to generation. Such practices are considered indigenous food system. There are different types of indigenous food system depending on geographical areas where they live. In the hill area, in ocean, in grassland, desert areas, etc. One good example of indigenous food system is practicing of shifting cultivation or rotation of farming. This form of agriculture is commonly practiced by indigenous uh, communities in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and even Europe in the old days. From the study on shifting cultivation that jointly undertaken by AIPP, IKEA, and FAO, in 2015, and the study found that this kind of cultivation has played a significant role in providing livelihoods and ensure food security to indigenous communities. Indigenous people's life, values, and culture are intricately linked to this form of agriculture. This form of, agriculture, of agricultural practice, unfortunately, has not been recognized by most of the uh, government in Asia. It considered backwards for all forms of agriculture, as it required different plots of land for rotating and use less and burn technique. Some are even considered it as the main cause of deforestation and causing global warming. Yeah. For, ex for example, like the case that happened in Thailand, Indigenous communities, therefore, have been introduced a new form of agriculture, yeah, particularly growing cash crop, which require a lot of chemical and fertilizers use, that of course causing a lot of damage to the uh, nature and environment. In addition, Indigenous communities have also faced with the invasion of the large-scale mining extractive industries, locking agri business, mega dams, and the expansion of protected areas without their free prior informed consent, which are adversely affecting their traditional livelihoods and food security. The question is how we can stop these problems and phenomenon and rehabilitate or scale up food practices of indigenous food system. Today, we will hear perspective and experiences from our speaker on the following issues. The first one, what are the good practices and initiatives of indigenous people on traditional livelihoods? Second, what are the key roles and contributions of indigenous women? Third, why indigenous knowledge, culture, and customary land rights are key to strengthen indigenous people's contribution to sustainable development goal number two, which is to end hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture and beyond. I have five speakers in my list. Uh, the first one, Mr. Gam Shimre from Northeast India. Uh, he is recently working at AIPP in Thailand. The second, 
uh, Miss Noeli Tung Mueang Tong from Thailand. The third one, uh, Mr. Raipan Chakma from Bangladesh. The fourth one, Miss Anne Latimbang from Malaysia. And the last one, Maliana Michelli from FAO. Yeah, I will introduce each a speaker in detail again yeah, when uh, they speak. So with this, I just like to begin with the first speaker, uh, Mr. Kam Chimre. Mr. Kam Chimre is a Naga. <clears throat> he is a devoted human rights activist for almost 30 years. He has held important positions and was part of civil rights and democratic rights initiatives. At the current Secretary General of the APP, he envisions to contribute to advancing the pursuit of indigenous people's rights and democratization in Asia. He has good knowledge and takes keen interest on issues of biodiversity, indigenous knowledge, and self-determination. He was also involved in his building initiative in India, he has authored some publications related to human rights, environment, and ethnic issues. Uh, Mr. Gam will speak on what is indigenous people, people food system. What do we need to understand about uh, this food system? Okay, Gam, you have the floor, so you have uh, seven minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Kitisak, and also good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants. Okay, so I would like to begin by sharing one important lesson that we have learned from this pandemic. Majority of starvation deaths, suicide cases, and poor health conditions due to sh shortage of food were those who had no access to their forests or have lost their lands and territories. On the other hand, those who still had access to forests or have rights over their lands and territories were more resilient and contributed to relieve work and supported other communities in need, including food. This demonstrates the importance of access to forests and control over lands and territories for resiliency, food security, and continuity of indigenous food systems. So this is one of the important lessons that we have learned. Now let me also base uh, my presentation on some facts, primarily from the FAO's report, 2018. FAO's estimates show that the number of hungry people has barely changed in the past few years. Large majority of countries in the region risk missing the zero hunger target of the SDG2. The situation is similarly challenging in nutrition and health uh, areas. Now, this is therefore what you see the number, the number of undernourished people in millions. So if you look at the statistics there from 2015 to 17, you will see that the number have hardly reduced in terms of undernourishment. Now, this has consequences and also moral imperatives because more than half of the world's malnourished children live in Asia and the Pacific. It is also home to the fastest growing prevalence of childhood obesity in the world. And therefore, you see a two contradictory picture there. This paradox is attributed to nutrition transition with children increasingly exposed to cheap and convenient unhealthy processed food. Now, there is a moral consequence to this. This is because this is a colossal human loss given the association between undernutrition and poor cognitive development. This means that the would-be geniuses who could potentially provide solutions to the problems of humanity are already denied of their potential and future. Now let me come to this issue of indigenous food system in this context. If you look at these slides on the top of the left-hand side, you will see a typical picture of a village, a uh, village territory. And if you zoom in, then you will see that a village often is divided uh, into different land use system. 
In the case study that I did in Thailand, in this particular community, they have divided their territory into six broad categories of land use system. And then if you zoom in in this particular categories of land use system, what you will find is that there are different subsystems within this broad category. This is an example of a rotational agriculture. Now, as you know that in the first year, they clear the land and then they plant their crops. And then the yield of the crops would vary, let's say 30 to 70 types of crops. No? But what you see here, the number of uh, uh, resources that you get, 602, as you can see in the slide, is actually the fallow period, year one fallow period includes kinds of animals, insects, pollinators, uh, vegetables, and so on. So if you move on from fellow year one to two, three, four, five, six, the types and the number of resources, resources that you find in the fellow land would vary all across. This shows the dynamic nature of the ecosystem, and it is never uh, a static. And also, this also demonstrate the kind of the symbiotic uh, relationship under which the ecosystem functions in a very dynamic way, which we can hardly comprehend. Now, this is true that if you zoom in into the specific land categories, whether it's the river system, the coastal area, the mountain, agriculture, and so on, you will find this kind of very intricate knowledge uh, that the indigenous communities have, and all these uh, functions um, uh, based on this uh, uh, reciprocity or the symbiotic relationship within an ecosystem. You know? Now, the symbiotic relationship that I'm talking about is not just limited to the other animals and the resources there, but it also includes the human beings, the communities. So, for instance, here you will see that this woman is sharing a poem about the shift in cultivation. This demonstrates the special relationship they have with the land and the resources. No? Um, and then in some communities, you find that when a baby is born, the umbilical cord is cut and tied to the tree to symbolize the connection with nature and unity with the forest. No? On the left-hand side, you see there, dead infants are buried in the tree in some communities because they see that the tree is healing. No? Now, and in some areas, it is strictly protected. Uh, they are ring fenced for the intrinsic value that they see in nature. And this cannot be equated with econom economic value. And in this case, one may say uh, the uh, hydro power, no? for instance, in this case. That is why, uh, therefore, we see the environment as part of our food and life support system. The water forest and the land that provides us food also provide food to other creatures. This is the reciprocal relationship that we are talking about. And that is the reason that we do rituals in the forest, in the watershed area, or in the agriculture, uh, agricultural area. And then we have uh, cultural practices that celebrates this relationship in every season and the harvest that we get from the surrounding areas. Now, therefore, to understand indigenous knowledge uh, food system, we must understand that indigenous food system is adapted to specific ecology and thrive on the principle of symbiosis. Knowledge and food and the spiritual and cultural practices that I have described are expressions of moral, ethical, and reciprocal relationship that we maintain with nature, and therefore it is holistic, holistic in the sense that we as human beings we extend our beings to the environment and the surrounding. So, so it is a much more holistic approach. It is therefore compatible with the idea and concept of nature-based solutions to climate crisis, biodiversity loss, food and nutrition, and sustainable lifestyle being proposed in the UNFCCC, CBD, and other multilateral uh, negotiations. Therefore, we have the capacity and the cultural resources to provide local-based solutions to global problems if the right and adequate support is provided. Finally, to revivify and to strengthen indigenous food system, 
means that we must weave again our knowledge, culture, and spirituality, as well as our profound relationship with nature. So I end with that now, uh, moderator. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Cam, yeah, for yeah, giving us the the idea what it's all about the indigenous food system, yeah, about the key characteristic yeah, of this kind of system, yeah, which is really important and integral part of the indigenous people's life. Yeah, thanks a lot, Cam. I think this will be yeah a basis yeah of the uh discussion yeah, later yeah, when yeah, we listen to other speakers. Okay, uh, the next speaker in my list is uh, Ms. Noeli Tungbeng Tong. Uh, Ms. Noeli, she is a chief of Hoi I Kang village. She belongs to Kalen indigenous group in Thailand. She is one of the prominent indigenous women leaders in Thailand. She is actively engaging on women's issues, promotion of indigenous knowledge and sustainable natural resource management at local and country levels. She has initiated Gandamu, uh, or Women's Forest, to create natural classroom for indigenous knowledge transmission food source and income generation for the people in her village. Currently, she's also the committee member of Indigenous Women Network in Thailand. Welcome and thanks again uh, for your time to join with us today. I know you travel from the village. I also would like you to share with us on what are the roles and contribution of Indigenous women in Indigenous food system since uh, you cannot speak English, uh, so Miss Pilawan will assist you yeah, on the translations. So you may need more time yeah, for that, <coughs> but uh, maximum 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Please go ahead, uh, Miss Noeli. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for giving me more time. ก็ก่อนที่จะพูดเนี่ยเราจะต้องพูดถึงคําสอนของบัพพชนนะคะของบทปกญญ์บอกว่าตาเกเลปะโมดีตาเกเลปะเป่าดีกระต่อยปะน
about the seed, uh, about the land, about the water, and it has to be safe for our future generation. The second one, when you're talking about protection, that means we have to protect our land, our seas, and also our residential area. These are uh, the things that is very important to us. บทบาทของเรามีเยอะมากบทบาทแต่แต่การดูแลเมล็ดพันธุ์เราจะเก็บเมล็ดพันธุ์ยังไงให้สามารถมีมีต่อแล้วก็ปลูกได้แล้วก
And of course, uh, only uh, our knowledge is not uh, only the thing, but our uh, culture also related to our belief. For example, in the Pakanyong people, we are uh, practicing our belief relating with the Mother Earth. We call it Laku. Laku is really happening in August. That's where we celebrate the abundance of the production from the crops, from uh, the, our farming, where we uh, respect, pay respect, and also worship to the Mother Earth, not that provide us the blessing to the crops. And also we requesting them to protect our product, no? เหล่านี้เนี่ยมันก็เป็นบทบาทของผู้หญิงที่ทําร่วมกับคนในชุมชนนะคะไม่ว่าจะเป็นผู้ชายเด็กเยาวชนอะไรต่างๆเราก็
indigenous knowledge, village common forest, deep bank and sustainable livelihood, among others. He is also involved with civil society organizations of climate justice network. Kakala Chali, as general secretary, you campaign groups of sustainable rural livelihoods, Bangladesh Indigenous People Network on Climate Change, and Biodiversity, Bangladesh Indigenous People Working Group on Food Security, and Kakakari Development Research and Learning Center. He will share with us today on how traditional farming uh, or agriculture ensuring the food security and well-being of indigenous communities in Bangladesh. Okay, Mr. Raiban, you have the floor now. Thank you, Mr. Kittisak and Juju, and good afternoon to all panelists and uh, viewers who are watching this program. So I have to go to my presentations. Can you help me? Okay, so today my topic is zoom cultivation or uh, rotational uh, agriculture, sustaining the indigenous knowledge and food security among indigenous people in Bangladesh. And this is the, my topics. Next. Uh, you know very well about the Chitong Hill Tracks. Uh, Chitang Hill is uh, located in the southeastern part of the Bangladesh and comprises of three hill district uh, of Bandarban, Rangamati, uh, and Kagasri. Uh, the reason is hilly and mountainous, uh, which made the region different from the part of Bangladesh. It shares some of its border with Myanmar and India. Uh, they are cutting indigenous communities living with their culture and traditions for several times. They have been practicing contributions for their livelihood and substantial economic of generation to generations. So, uh, Zoom Cultivation CST. Uh, Zoom Cultivation is a diversified uh, multi-cropping based agriculture, uh, which is popular as Zoom Cultivation in Zoom Text, Bangladesh. Uh, in Bangladesh, around uh, 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 4,000, uh, 40,000 indigenous families are dependent on Zoom cultivation, uh, basically, in uh, particularly in Sitong Hill Tracks, a big uh, portion of which belong to Chakma, Tripura, Marma communities. Uh, Zoom cultivation, sustaining the indigenous knowledge and food security among indigenous communities in Sitong Hill Tracks. Actually, uh, uh, our uh, way of life, uh, lifestyle, food habitat, food habit, habitat, habitat patterns and design, game, festival, beliefs, values, norms and culture of indigenous people based on the Zoom cultivation. So uh, many, uh, uh, most of the team, of their uh, cultures and customs are made around the Zoom cultivations. And uh, many hard tossing literary works, dance, and songs we are composed or made based on the Zoom cultivation. Next. Uh, and also substantial based economy which is uh, largely dependent on forest and zoom cultivations. Uh, uh, therefore, these people have uh, a strong indigenous knowledge and practices on uh, livelihood, forest management, agroforestry, and conservation systems, which contribute to food security of indigenous people in Chitong Hill Tracks. 
Jumpil is a source of uh, uh, food basket, you know, where paddy is the common crop and hundreds of local variety of seeds are used to June cultivations. Actually, June is a source of indigenous knowledge where legumes and flowers are grown together to enrich soil fertility, soil erosion, and controlling insect. The farmer can harvest crop in different periods so that they can uh, able to reserve food for nearly eight ten months in a year. June fill is abundant for two to three years nutrients. Occasion remaining crops are collected from the abundant fields. The community people collect murder seeds from June field for next germinations. And uh, June is an important, uh, uh, play an important role in text. And we also have some benefits from the June cultivations. Like a uh, June field is a source of food of any state, my college before. And it is a very and easy uh, 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 for marginalized and landless people to grow food for sustainable livelihood. And easy technique to for marginalized people. It's no need to use fertilizer and pesticide. Uh, use land to get all nutrients. It helps to ensure more productivity and sustainability of ag agriculture. So uh, all benefits uh, uh, goes to the zoo, uh, cultivations. That's why uh, today uh, through this uh, uh, program, so I'm demanding uh, to recognize the zoom cultivators as farmer and to bring under a social safety net program in Bangladesh. So thank you, Mr. Uh, moderator, thank you. And, and yeah, of course, it is a source of food, yeah, of the uh, indigenous peoples there. And this also requires specific knowledge. And this form of agriculture is also yeah, appropriate, yeah, for the hill areas. I think that this is very clear, yeah, with the benefits from uh, the jum cultivations. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Raipan, yeah, for your presentations on this. So the next speaker in my list is Ms. Anne Lassimbang. Anne Lassimbang is a founder of the executive director of a local non-profit organization called PACOS. All partners of community organizations involved in rural indigenous community development in Sabah, Borneo, Malaysia. PACOS was awarded the Malaysia UN Award 2017 for its outstanding contribution to the sustainable development goals. Since 1993, she has set up 27 rural community learning centers in Sabah. This center provides opportunity for children in remote areas of Sabah to have the best possible start in their education and learn about traditional knowledge. She's also a trainer in community organizing for PACOS and actively promotes gender awareness in the classroom levels as well as native customary land rights. She's a strong advocate of ecology and food security among indigenous community in Sabah. Today, she will share with us on how indigenous people conservation system contribute to food security. And now you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Kitty Sak, for that introduction. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think, uh, yeah, my slide is on. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, who is attending this webinar. First of all, uh, congratulations to AIPP for organizing this series of discussions 
in conjunction with the International Indigenous Day Celebration 2020. Thank you also for giving me this opportunity to share in this session. Uh, I think it's the fourth, fourth session or, yeah, it's uh, the weaving knowledge, culture and customary land rights with indigenous peoples. And I think GAM gave a very good introduction to give us the overview of how the worldview, worldview of indigenous people. So maybe next slide. Okay, thank you. So uh, before I go to the topic that I'm talking about, uh, how indigenous people's conservation system contribute to the food security, uh, I will be sharing that experience uh, because I uh, I come from the I come from the island of Borneo. We are from Sabah, the northern part of Borneo, uh, and the island. And uh, the indigenous peoples in this region are very diverse. Uh, and even our terrain is also very diverse. We have the sea surrounding us. And we also have the highest mountain in Southeast Asia, Mount Kinabalu, located in our region. And um, we share our land mass with also Indonesia in Kalimantan and Brunei. So, uh, but basically, uh, the indigenous people on this island of Borneo uh, have a lot of similarities. So the sharing today will be based on that uh, experience that we have here and the system. Maybe the next page. Okay. So um, how do we? How do we? Uh, uh, our system contribute to food security? Yeah. So. I think, um, firstly, I would like to explain the in this uh, indigenous people's conservation systems. And we are uh, very happy today that uh, this year, year 2020, we, had, we have a lot of opportunity, especially when uh, AIPP is organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, so uh, similarly to what Gam has explained, um in our in our community we we also see our our system in two realms that is the spiritual and the physical realm uh, so it's divided into what is seen and and seen uh, what we practice is the one that we see so a lot of times people only look at what they see what is in the physical what they can see in the practice but very important to understand that um, uh, we also have that spiritual part of it. Uh, so, and then it's holistic, and then we cannot separate these two worldview, and everything is interconnected. And to make it uh, maybe easier to understand, uh, we we can see it into the three uh, parts. First thing is the principle, concept, and practice. So then we it will be easier to understand uh, this system in terms of the principles that's the value we look at the harmony and balance respect we see that it's god given so it's, now we are using the word sustainable but actually for in 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 terms of the principles of our systems um, the dignity and the interrelationship of all things finite nature of resources sustainability and that of every action there is a reaction are the key principles of nature of our uh, conservation system and indigenous communities understand that there is a limit to what can be extracted uh, from the environment and what can and and they are only the custodians of god's gift we we do not own what is around us in, in terms of the concept, uh, the concept is a lot to do with respect and care for all things. We give and take, there's reciprocity. And uh, in our language, we say gompi guna o, use and uh, protect and use. So this concept of respect for all living and non-living things underlies the principle of dignity of all things. And uh, the recognition that all methods have a spirit. 
Uh, as such, it discourages the arbitrary taking of life, be it plants, animals, birds, insects, as well as indiscriminately destruction of the environment through earth moving and other activities. So that's why we have this uh, concept of Gompi Guno or use and uh, care and protect that ensures the natural resources are utilized in a sustainable manner. The communal ownership of resources and practice of taking only what is needed from the natural environment um, underlies the principle of finite resources. So we have many different kinds of, of concepts that um, our experience that if we, like for me, I'm from the Kadazan Dusun uh, community, if we say we have the concept of Ohusiano, experiencing something bad in return for doing something bad or disrespectful. So we have all this concept and uh, that is contributing to the uh, ensuring the food resources. So, um, and uh, like for, in for instance, the excessive taking of fish in rivers and wildlife in the forest are regulated by adherence um, adherence of certain adat or belief uh, where uh, sometimes if we take too much, then suddenly uh, we see somebody uh, in the appearance of the person and that person gets killed or, or drowned in the river. So it, it's the concept and our belief. And uh, so we also have the concept of leaving the last fruit on the tree to ensure that uh, there's a continued propagation of fruit trees. Uh, so that's the principle of sustainability. And finally, the third uh, uh, practice, uh, the third uh, idea is the practice. So we, where we normally can see uh, where we have the tagal is very famous. I will speak more about that. Tawal, the tra and then using the traditional calendar, like looking at the moon when we we take the food or when we plant. So uh, those are the three uh, I, uh, aspects of our system. Maybe next slide. Then I will talk. Yeah. So um, I will speak more on the Tagal system. This is uh, uh, recognized already by the government. Uh, this has been adopted by the government in their law. Um, a lot of people come and uh, read, uh, learn about this, but this is one of the indigenous people's uh, conservation system that has been recognized by the government. Uh, this is something to do with uh, how we manage and conserve the river. Yeah, uh, It's a grassroots initiative of river resources and conservation and management. So when the number of fish is uh, on the decline in rivers, a communal understanding uh, can be proclaimed through the ceremony of what we call managal, that is marking the stretch of river as no fishing zone for a certain period of time. Normally one, uh, six months to one year, but normally one to two years. And uh, the, pro the proclamation is performed through a ceremony and uh, called monogit, where the community slaughters a pig and cook it and eat it together. And by observing the abstinence period, the fish resources is allowed to reproduce and increase in number. Yeah, so uh, that's one of the uh, concept or the belief system or the conservation system that we are practicing here. Maybe next, then I can show a little bit more about that. So um, a lot of times people understand. So if we are going, if you have a uh, Tagal uh, river, so so that means we, there will be no fish. And uh, people will want to eat fish. So how, what happened? That's always the argument here. But actually, um, in when we practice the Tagal, the, the 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 river is divided into the three zone where this three zone are uh, divided into what we call the red yellow and green uh, i mean it can be some other color but we just want to use the traffic light so when it's it, the red zone are the are the area where the there is no fishing 
uh, is entirely bam yeah so uh, the fish normally uh, this is the place where normally the fish breeds yeah so because we don't catch the fish we don't go at the red zone in the yellow zone uh, actually there's prohibiting of fishing but there are certain circumstances that means you can come and fish here in the yellow zone anytime especially when uh, we have this uh, pregnant woman have this desire to eat a fish or somebody is sick or an elderly person so actually the, the yellow zone is where we we prohibit fishing but it's always open 24 366 days so that, that's the yellow zone and the green zone this is the green zone where uh which is only open when according to season and normally open open for one or two days one in two years so these are include when it's open uh, members of the community living outside the village for instance you are in town or you are somewhere you got married to somebody but you came from that village when we open the green zone you are normally invited to take part so you can see the picture the fish are caught from the green zone and it's divided um, uh, among the villagers and the people in the community and so uh, over the years this actually we have almost forgotten this practice but there was a time when our river was almost dead uh, even though the government banned people start to put poison in the river or they tried to bomb the fish to get the river to get the river to get the fish and then suddenly our river is dead but then the community uh, decided to reintroduce this practice and what happened is now all our fish are, uh, our rivers are alive again and people and even now the government has adopted it and if Ever, the anybody uh, break the law or break the tagal, uh, you will be given sogit or the compensation. That means you will, if we slaughtered one buffalo during the opening ceremony, you will have to pay to the community one buffalo or one pig or whatever, one goat. So that's what we call the sogit or the uh, punishment. Yeah, maybe the next last slide. But, um, we have found this, it has helped us, especially in strengthening our food security in our community. Um, now we are facing so much problem with uh, COVID-19. Uh, people are uh, facing this uh, lockdown, but we, we realize and we observe from, uh, from our village and other villages in Sabah, those community who, have, who are still practicing their uh, conservation system, who still have their resources intact, um, they have no issue with uh, food insecurity or afraid to go hungry. But still, there is challenges. Uh, the first one is, um, I think, uh, how do we pass this to the next generation? Nowadays, parents and family are too busy and uh, children don't have the opportunity to learn um, all these uh, practices. So. That's one of the challenges that we are facing at the moment. How do we, the continuity of these uh, practices. And then of course, the globalization. Um, we have new belief systems, new gadgets, and new knowledge, which is more interesting. Um, and then of course, our belief system is considered to be uh, superstitious, uh, not scientific, and it's, you know, outdated. Uh, people want in. Um, I see my son. He only he's always li listening to podcasts, but it's not talking about indigenous knowledge. It's talking about the computer, new new computer program. So uh, <laughs> he's not interested to learn about uh, indigenous system. And finally, uh, climate change. Um, now it's very hard to follow the seasons and uh, rapid development that this does not respect the uh, balance of the environment. That's uh, one of our biggest challenge. And finally, the recognition of indigenous uh, people system and knowledge. Um, it, you, we require, it requires understanding and need to be highlighted. Like today, we are, have this opportunity to talk about our system and hopefully uh, through more 
uh, highlighting of this, people will also uh, understand us better and uh, will use the knowledge. So I think uh, that's it for now. I think that I have to share. Uh, thank you very much and on Sico. I hope okay. enough time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anne. Yeah, for your very clear idea. Yeah, how uh, how effective yeah? the IP conservation system. Yeah, from the principal concept and you know, also practice. And of course, there are also uh, new challenges that the communities are facing with. And I hope yeah, next time when you open the green zone, yeah, inviting us, yeah, we will go and join you. Okay, thank you again. Uh, uh, my last speaker is Ms. Mariana uh, Bichiri. Uh, she's a human rights lawyer with extensive experience working on gender, indigenous issues, natural resource governance, and land policy and legislation. She has considerable field and research-based knowledge of key policy issues around gender equality and women's rights, indigenous people's rights, legal empowerment of vulnerable groups, gender security, land rights, and territorial development. Since 2005, she has been working for FAO across Africa and Asia after leading country-based projects on gender issues, customary tenure, legal empowerment and land rights as chief technical advisor. She is now serving FAO as land tenure officers in the FAO regional office for Asia and the Pacific. She will share with us on why land tenure security is important for indigenous peoples in the context of food security. So Maliana, now you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I cannot see the presentation yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. So first of all, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. I would like to thank AIPP for the opportunity to join the discussion today, sharing perspectives about connections and the importance of land tenure security for indigenous peoples in the context of food security and FAO experiences in relation to these issues. Next slide, please. Um, so as we know, land has a great significance for indigenous peoples. Land is not just an economic asset. It's linked to cultural, social, religious, and spiritual practices. Land provides shelter, and it's a key source of livelihoods. Land is also a key element for indigenous people's food and nutrition security, given their reliance on agricultural, agriculture for food production. Land tenure security is also closely linked with the enjoyment of fundamental human rights, such as the right to food, shelter, and an adequate standard of living. Despite the undeniable importance of tenure security, Indigenous peoples do not enjoy secure rights over the land they depend on. That happens in this region, but it's not a problem only here, that it's mostly a global problem. Most land in developing countries is under customary tenure systems. According to the International Federation of Surveyors, 70% of land in developing countries is unregistered, which means that people, indigenous peoples, access land through customary tenure systems. Uh, the absence of a legal formal recognition sometimes creates the misperception that indigenous peoples do not enjoy or do not have rights over their land. Legislation and land administration systems are frequently inadequate and as a result indigenous people's land is considered free from occupation and granted to private investors allocated for development projects or designated protected areas. However, according to international law, 
And in some cases in this region, also national law, indigenous peoples do have rights, do have legitimate tenure rights over the land. They have been using sometimes for generations. That said, regrettably, some governments tend to prioritize private investments without realizing that by dispossessing indigenous peoples from their land, they are driving them into poverty, food insecurity, and in some instances, contributing to conflicts and human rights violations. Next slide, please. So to address these issues, FAO has been implementing a series of activities that include developing information tools for evidence-based policy dialogue and policy design. So we've been carrying out field research studies, preparing technical documents. Last year, we uh, published four policy briefs on protecting and recognizing customary tenure in the Mekong region. Uh, we have now six other policy briefs under development, which should be published by next year. We have been also organizing capacity development and awareness raising activities targeted to government, civil society, indigenous people's organizations, sometimes uh, separated, sometimes we bring these groups together to try to create a consensus and enable the governments to understand the perspectives of indigenous peoples and other communities with customary tenure systems. And of course, through these activities, we also raise awareness about the voluntary guidelines on responsible governance of tenure, which states that um, states should recognize customary tenure uh, of indigenous peoples and recognize their land, their land rights. Uh, FAO has been also supporting member countries through technical assistance for developing legal and policy frameworks. So in this technical assistance, we usually bring experience, successful experience from other countries. We bring elements of the voluntary guidelines, human rights, and we highlight issues of special concern, such as the importance of recognizing customary tenure and indigenous people's rights. And of course, passing legislation is only a first step. It's really important to ensure the legislation is implemented in practical terms. So as much as possible, we have been trying to engage with donors and raise funds, collaborate with governments and developing programs at country level. So this legislation and policies are implemented and can become a reality, can become something concrete and can help securing the rights of indigenous peoples. So through these activities, we hope that we can add value to the work and the efforts of many organizations, indigenous peoples organizations, other UN agencies, governments, and at the same time, inspire governments to undertake and pursue develop economic development opportunities that are inclusive, that will not be carried out by dispossessing um, indigenous peoples or taking away their land and livelihoods, and ensuring that this, this de development opportunities will leave no one behind. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks uh, again, yeah, Mariana. Yeah. So you have highlighted on how important the the uh, the land tenure security is for indigenous communities, and also yeah, the challenge that uh, indigenous communities are facing, and also the initiative of the FAO on these issues. I think these are so important, and I hope that uh, this kind of initiative uh, can be scaled up and expand to many countries in Asia. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. <clears throat> now, I think that uh, we will open yeah, for questions and answers. I 
have seen so far the questions you know, from the audience i think uh, the first question is for Anne and maybe for Cam. Uh, yeah, the, the question is on what are the threats to indigenous people of Malaysia and Indonesia due to farm cultivation? And this one will be to Cam, yeah? In North East India, the central government of India is planning to expand palm oil cultivation in Northeast India states. Well, but that might be just for information, it's not a question, yeah? Okay, yeah, while waiting for the other questions, maybe Anne can answer now, yeah? What are the threats to indigenous people in Malaysia yeah, due to the expansion of palm oil plantation? Yeah, um, you can hear me, okay? Yeah. Uh, definitely the monocrop oil palm plantation there's uh, a number of monocrops in uh, in Malaysia in Sabah in particular uh, there's the rubber acacia and now uh, very promoted very much by the government uh, is uh, palm oil cultivation and uh, definitely because uh, it's a commodity and at the at this point in time it is a commodity that is uh, to be um, ex exported so when uh, when areas are open for oil palm a uh, big area and planted that means uh, a lot of the uh, food security i mean the first thing is if the, they have water, uh, catchment area is also destroyed. If it is a jungle before, all the animals will also run away. And if they have rivers, if once you start to use uh, 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 pesticides, chemicals, uh, it's also uh, make the river dead. So uh, definitely it it is one of the biggest threat to food security uh, in, 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 in Sabah, uh, where because a lot of the communities, because they have already planted with oil palm, they maybe they are not able to plant rice or food. They might, uh, at the moment, we, there might be some community who try to uh, plant a little bit of uh, uh, vegetables and things like that but once the trees are very big um, underneath uh, is you know it has to be cleared all the time so that is easier to collect the fruit bunch and all that so definitely uh, there is a big threat of monocrops and that is one of them is the oil palm cultivation um, we are also trying to to promote now to community because oil palm has been uh, promoted as one of the poverty eradication um, uh, system or uh, an uh, approach by the by a lot of the government agency. Uh, but in the end, uh, we we also observe that the communities are actually still very poor because the prices of oil palm is beyond their control so uh, it does not help them and worse uh, their food security is gone and uh, we have made an observation during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic where a lot of the communities were in lockdown we realized and we saw that communities that are practicing or in the midst of oil palm plantation or in a monocrop area uh, they they have uh, issue of you know asking for food aid so you we can already see the correlation of uh, when once the, the environment once the area has been converted into monocrops 
it can impact the food security. Okay, thank you very much, Anne. Um, yeah, we received so far only one questions, and there's no further questions on this. Probably, yeah, uh, for the final round, I also would like to uh, ask everyone, yeah, to say a few words, yeah, about yeah what we going to do, yeah, to continue this kind of good practice of indigenous people yeah we listen already yeah, to the the indigenous uh food system overview and also the uh concrete example of how this kind of uh, system yeah is working yeah on the cloud but the challenge is a uh, yeah, this kind of uh, practice is like is uh, decreasing in number yeah, in terms of uh, practicing in different areas because of the government policies, law, whatever. And yeah, <clears throat> I think this uh, yeah this question I also like everyone to say something yeah, on on that. Now I think that uh, okay there. Are, uh, a few questions I, I I saw it right now. Yeah, the the first one is on on how forthcoming our development partners, government agencies, local government, in particular, to support in documentations and disseminations of different indigenous practices and knowledge. Yeah, that's the first one. And what is the challenge to engage them further? Youths are not always keen to learn about our language, our indigenous practices and culture, etc. How to engage youth in learning about our practices? Yeah, this is the uh, the questions from the audience. And another one is the uh, are designated protected areas a problem for uh, indigenous people's food security and land tenure? Okay, I think I have uh, two questions uh, at the moment. Probably this also addressed to all speakers. I don't know who would like to uh, respond first. Okay, who would like to respond first about the the yeah how forthcoming are development partners like government agency, local government yeah, to support in documentations and disseminations uh, of uh, different indigenous practices and knowledge. Yeah, how and, and another one is the challenge to engage them, yeah, and also how to also involve the youth yeah, in this kind of uh, learning and, and transmission of knowledge. Uh, who would like to respond first? You can also look at the, uh, the question that's sent into the, what you call the, uh, in the, message, the messengers box. And Cam, okay, would like to respond, okay. And then, no, Ali, Cam? Yes, thank you, Kidisa. I think um, on those more of the local issue, I would prefer that our other speakers who are working on, on the ground respond. But just to connect with the issue of Anne and also the issue of the question relating to challenging uh, the challenge with reference to engaging with the governments and the youths. <laughs> Um, I think the question is sounds simple, but it's very tough to answer. Uh, the first thing I would say is that, of course, we should continue if there is opportunity for good partnership with governments because we are open and uh, also to continue our good practices because we would like to continue to demonstrate so that our traditional practices and institutions remain intact and are not uh, uh, broken down. Because the more broken down it would be, uh, 
uh, our youths will be drifted away from our roots more and more. You know? So the first thing for the youth definitely, I think, is to realize that we are no longer in the same situation and our traditional institutions and practices are uh, uh, being eroded or being destroyed. And therefore, we are in a very struggling situation. Therefore, everything may not look good, everything may not look attractive for the youth, but they must realize the importance of the worldview that indigenous peoples hold and what is the meaning of being an indigenous and thereby they being able to find purpose and meaning in their life. So without their identity, can they really find a purpose and uh, meaning in their life is the question that the youth themselves must seriously think about. And if they begin to realize this, I'm sure that they will find their own way through. You know? Now with mm -hmm. the government, I just want to say that, as we know, the main challenge with engaging with the government is always the government comes up with three things. One is that indigenous people's rights is a threat to the disintegration of the territory of a state, one. Two is that indigenous people's rights is a threat to national security. The third thing is that indigenous peoples are always against the national interests of development and therefore they will promote mining, uh, palm oil, and many such other development aggressions and indigenous peoples are just thrown up. So this is the basic argument that the government will always propagate. So, in that situation, what happens? We have no option but to struggle. No? So the option for us is to continue to struggle while we also are open to partnership and working to, uh, together. But the point that I'm trying to raise is that we should do away with the myth that the governments are not responding to our issues because of lack of political will. No? It is not the lack of political will, but it is the lack of vision. Our worldviews, our practices, and the way the mainstream society and the government thinks is not meeting. There is no meeting point. So the government's political will is in terms of strong security control, strong economic development, no matter how resources are destroyed. So their mm -hmm. political will is directed towards another interest and our interests are not meeting and therefore that is where the point of conflict is. And that point of conflict is hard to be dealt with if there is no meeting of this vision. So this issue of meeting of vision, that is the lack of vision, you know, creating this new vision is very essential and that is where we need a lot of support. And of course, we are always open to partnership that will lead us towards this kind of a transformative path where we have a meeting of vision and where we can work together. Yeah, moderator, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Cam. And I think because of the time, yeah, shall we address the other uh, question as well? There are now a few more questions coming up. Yeah, another one is the how disseminated uh, protected areas a problem for uh, indigenous people, food security, and land tenure. Okay, talking about protected areas, yeah, how this uh, affect yeah uh, the the uh, indigenous food security and land tenure. Uh, I don't know who would like to uh, respond to these questions. Probably Mariana, you like to respond to this question? Yes, please. Uh, yes, I can reply, but could you uh, repeat because I couldn't get the last part. Okay, uh, <clears throat> the question is, are these segmented protected areas a problem for indigenous people, land tenure uh, and food security? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the question. And I think the reply, the simple reply to this question is yes. <clears throat> and the challenge is that quite frequently governments believe that by designating a certain area, protected area, they are doing good and they are protecting the environment. But the fact is that 
there are plenty of studies and actually there's one from the World Bank indicating that most of the biodiversity in the planet is uh, on indigenous people's land uh, which demonstrates that indigenous peoples are acting actually protecting the environment it may not be necessary to declare certain area protected area because the only reason why we still have some biodiversity in the planet is because of the physical presence and the practices of indigenous peoples of course when then certain area is designated protected area indigenous people lose the rights the legitimate tenure rights that they have over that area and they are evicted they lose the land they lose their livelihoods and as consequence they will be driven into poverty and to food insecurity so this is a major issue and i think it's really important that our organizations work with governments to demonstrate that this is a miscalculation um, simply declaring certain area protected areas and evicting indigenous peoples is not a smart way of protecting the environment i think this is the bottom line okay thank, thank you very you. much uh, maliana for you uh, respond to that question and the next question probably this will be to no ali or Anne. yeah is for what are the ways we could teach indigenous youth about traditional knowledge of managing food system and you like to respond or no aliโอเคค่ะก็จะต่อจากแกเมื่อกี้นะคะว่าการที่อยากจะให้เยาวชนน่ะมีส่วนร่วมตรงนี้เนี่ยเราจะต้องพัฒนาระบบการศึกษานะค
otherwise if we don't do that we 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 wait until the government uh, uh, absorb or put this uh, knowledge into the curriculum we uh, we do that campaign all the time but while waiting for that we we to add up we also do some community activities so for instance a lot of times uh, because a lot of our youths are also very interested in 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 gadgets so we we try to put that uh, activity in into something that they can listen they can learn uh, using the computer and things like that and we also have uh, festivals activity where we where we make uh, when we gather all the youths we they do like uh, they find all these names traditional names or traditional trees or traditional medicine they go around and they write it down they do it as games and uh and, and so while they're enjoying themselves they also learn so that's uh some of the things that we do um and then during festival we purposely do activity also to ensure that the youth are also involved uh, in the preparation, in, in all the activity, in the rituals. So at least um, uh, that's how we try to ensure that the the knowledge and the practices will not be lost. Because okay. it's always a challenge. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, I think we almost uh, finished the time. So we, I don't know how much time we can extend yeah, to these stations, but uh, we almost, uh, run out of time and there's still two questions. So I just quickly read out the questions and see how, if we have time, then we can respond to that, yeah? Before I give the floor to right one, yeah, I will uh, uh, read out the questions. The, uh, the next one is what are, uh, uh, no, no, okay. The, the next question is, do you have any advice for engaging international researchers especially young researchers of biodiversity conservations and food traditions okay and another question is how can indigenous communities as a global group show how unfccc sdgs preservations of the environment are economically viable and part of government responsibility and needs to be political view to have the vision to increase the economic values of this approach. Yeah, these are the two questions that's coming up. Uh, and I don't know how much time we, we have because we already run out of time. So probably just a few minutes yeah, before this we can extend. Okay, right one, please. Yes. Thank you, Kittisak. Just I want to uh, 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 address the previous questions uh, regarding the documentations. Uh, basically, in Bangladesh, we are doing uh, 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 documentation in our ourselves, and we are also trying uh, uh, to link up with the government programs. And uh, lastly, actually, we should establish a relationship with the governments, and we should uh, uh, advocacy work more. Uh, regarding on good practices of uh, safety cultivations. And uh, about the challenges, actually in Tito Hiltrex, we are worried uh, uh, about uh, uh, the uh, RAT Plus program because uh, Bangladesh now in a readiness phase, they already completed. Now they are ready to uh, 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 start uh, a RAT Plus program in Tito Hiltrex. So, and uh, our uh, Challenge also, uh, zooming period, you know, uh, zooming period is uh, reducing. So uh, now the farmers are getting uh, less productivity due to the, the zooming cycle. And uh, already we lost many of local seeds from uh, 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 who, uh, which uh, are most uh, defendable and uh, popular and citron text like uh, 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 aromatic seeds, aromatic rice, uh, those rice are no more. And also uh, uh, here, uh, 
Zoom cultivators uh, not recognized as a farmer in Chitonuchas because uh, uh, we, in uh, ordinary definitions of farmers, uh, because they are out of the uh, uh, definitions of farmer because they have no uh, entitled land, because uh, uh, zooming land is not recognized by the government. So that's why they are uh, deprived and they are uh, 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 they are not getting government facilities uh, like uh, uh, rationing system, uh, social safety net like that, and government subsidy also. So this is also uh, very very challenges in situ group checks. And also during the pandemic, the Zoom uh, farmers, Zoom cultivators, are suffering food crisis. So this is the challenging. So uh, uh, through these uh, programs, uh, I am uh, requesting uh, to the governments uh, 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 just to address the issues in Chipong Text. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right back. Yeah, I think because of the time, yeah, I also should wrap up uh, our uh, sessions. I think, well, there's still a video screening at the end of these sessions. Now, before this, I think I just like to thank all speakers yeah, for your presentations and apologize yeah, for the audience uh, questions. Yeah. There are a few of them we could not answer because of the time. And I think today we already learned yeah, about the, the worldviews of uh, indigenous food system and, and also indigenous uh, conservation system. And also we also learned about the concrete example of how yeah, we are doing, yeah, we learn from Bangladesh, we learn from Thailand, we also learn from experience from Malaysia and how yeah, this kind of worldview or concept yeah, translate into <coughs> practice on the ground. Yeah, I think this kind of issue is quite important and some of activities already acknowledged by the government of Malaysia, like the car system, I think this is a good initiative for, for us and I think yeah, the question is how yeah, do we yeah, rehabilitate and, and how to scale up this kind of uh, issues yeah, to be uh, yeah, used or practiced yeah, widely yeah, in different communities. Yeah, that remains a challenge and also hope that the initiative of FAO also can also support yeah, this kind of uh, initiative yeah, of us. And uh, with this, I, I just like to actually, yeah, uh, as you know, yeah, yeah, I just like to acknowledge the support and also contribution also from our uh, networks and member organizations of AIPP in 14 countries. And yeah, if we also have different networks like uh, Indigenous People Human Rights Defender Network, Indigenous uh, Voices in Asia Network, Network of Indigenous Women in Asia, Indigenous People and Knowledge of Asia, uh, indigenous youth network. Yeah, they also uh, you know, work really hard yeah, to make this kind of event uh, possible. And also, I would like to acknowledge the contribution from our donors and partners, like uh, Probo Environmental Facility, small grant program of the UNDP, European Union, uh, International Land Coalition, International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs, Missolio. Norwegian Agency for Development uh, Cooperation, Swedish uh, International Development Cooperation Agency, Swedish Society for Nature Conservation, Amapai Trust Fund, Wise CBD Secretariat uh, Forest People Program. Yeah, I think these are all the our uh, supportive organizations and donors. Yeah, so I just like to acknowledge and thank them here. And with this, I think we, yeah, as I said, that because of the time constraint and, and we should end our session by uh, video screening, the one that uh, the Indigenous Media Network just recently uh, yeah, produced yeah, for it is really short video. Yeah? Okay, uh, shall we yeah, uh, watch the video right now?
ที่นี้เป็นศูนย์เรียนรู้พันธุกรรมพืชพื้นบ้านชาติพันธุ์รีสูและเป็นสำนักง,งานของสมาคมสร้างเสริมสุขภาวะชุมชนชาติพันธุ์ด้วยที่หลายๆคนนะฮะรู้จักที่นี่ในนามสวนฉันกับเธอเราก็แบ่งพื้นที่เป็น2ส,ส่วนใหญ่ๆนะครับโซนแรกก็จะเป็นโซนที่อยู่ข้างบนนะครับเป็นที่เนินนะครับก็17ไร่นะครับแล้วก็โซนที่2เนี่ยก็เป็นโซนที่เป็นพื้นราบนะครับห้าไร่นะรวมทั้ง2แห่งเนี่ยนะครับเราก็ปลูกพืชมากกว่าร้อยชนิดนะครับส่วนแรกจะเน้นเรื่องของไม้ใช้สอยนะครับไม้พืชเศรษฐกิจแล้วก็ไม้พืชสมุนไพรต่างๆนะฮะทีนี้ส่วนที่2ที่เป็นพื้นราบเนี่ยเน้นเรื่องของพืชอาหารนะครับที่เรากินใช้ในชีวิตประจําวันนะครับแล้วก็รวมทั้งพืชบางตัวที่สามารถสร้างเป็นรายได้ด้วยนะครับประมาณ5้าชนิดนะครับเวลาเราพูดถึงเรื่องความมั่นคงทางอาหารนะครับเราก็คงไม่ใช่พูดถึงแค่เรื่องพืชแต่เราจะพูดถึงนะแหล่งโปรตีนนะที่เป็นสัตว์ด้วยนะที่นี่ก็จะมีการเลี้ยงปลานะครับเลี้ยงไก่นะไก่ก็เอาไว้กินทั้งกินเนื้อแล้วก็กินไข่นะครับไข่พื้นเมืองก็ไข่จะมาเล็กๆประมาณนี้นะเท่าลูกปิงปองนะในช่วงสถานการณ์โควิดที่เกิดขึ้นนะครับเราก็ได้บริจาคนะครับข้าวสารอาหารแห้งที่เป็นผลผลิตของศูนย์เนี่ยนะครับให้กับคนที่ได้รับประสบภัยนะครับโควิดเนี่ยก็ประมาณ1ตันนอกนั้นเราก็นะฮะแจกมเมล็ดพันธุ์ประมาณ 2,000 ชุดให้กับผู้ประสบภัยโควิดให้เขาได้ไปปลูกนะฮะได้ไปใช้ประโยชน์เพื่อสร้างความมั่นคงทางอาหารให้กับตัวเองครอบครัวและก็สังคมครับเราก็ได้รับนะครับความร่วมมือนะฮะในการทํางานเนี่ยหลายฝ่ายด้วยกันยกตัวอย่างเช่นถ้าองค์กรในพื้นที่ก็เป็นชุมชนนะครับแล้วก็องค์กรในในในประเทศอย่างเช่นภาคีองค์กรต่างๆนะเครือข่ายชนเผ่าพื้นเมืองแห่งประเทศไทยนะองค์กรนานาชาติก็อย่างเช่น AIPP เป็นต้นซึ่งการส่งเสริมความมั่นคงทางอาหารเนี่ยมันต้องร่วมมือร่วมแรงนะฮะไม่ว่าจะเป็นหน่วยงานใดก็ตามก็สามารถทําให้ชุมชนเนี่ยนะสร้างขวัญและกำลังใจในการสร้างความมั่นคงทางอาหารโอเค I think that's the the end of the session okay once again thank you very much to all the speakers for your contributions and your presentation I think this really really uh, Valuables and really good experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.